And um, I'd like to introduce now uh, Jody Lehman. Um, Jody uh, is the founding chief legal officer for health affairs for Florida International University and holds an appointment as an assistant professor in the Herbert Wertheim College of Medicine's Department of Health Humanities and Society and in the FIU Colleges of Business and Law. She uh, oversees all the healthcare related legal services for the university and is a member of the leadership group responsible for the st strategic direction of the College of Medicine and the faculty group practice. Uh, before joining FIU, uh, she was uh, Baptist Health South Florida's first corporate vice president and general counsel and a member of the senior leadership group responsible for Baptist Health's growth strategy. Uh, prior to joining Baptist, uh, she was a partner at the law firm of Mershon, Sawyer, Johnston, Dunwoody, and Cole, and chaired his healthcare practice. Uh, she's currently pursuing a Master of Healthcare Delivery Science at Dartmouth and uh, received her JD from Boston University School of Law. She is an inductee of Phi Beta Kappa and graduated with high honors as an outstanding four-year scholar. So, Jody. Thank you, Peter, that was very nice. And what a great tribute. It is my pleasure, my honor, and I'm delighted to be introducing um, Pedro, Joe Greer. And Joe made me promise I wouldn't call him Dr. Greer. And so he's also making you promise that you're not gonna call him Dr. Greer. So if you haven't spoken to him already, just hey, Joe. Um, so I have known about Joe since the beginning of my legal career because Joe made quite a mark in our community. Um, he's a phenomenally accomplished physician, academician, uh, educator, advocate, author. And um, I don't know, I, I really can't say where the passion came from, but Joe figured out, and he was my neighbor for a number of years at work, so I used to hear a lot of Joe. <laughs> if you spend any time with Joe, you know that Joe is not a soft-spoken person. <laughs> And her walls are a little thin, so um, I know a lot of jokes, I just can't deliver them. Um, but Joe uh, started working with homeless people, and when I say working with them, caring for them, uh, during his training in Miami. And he would go uh, under bridges, and there's a reason I'm telling this story in addition to how incredibly compelling it is. He would go under bridges and he would approach homeless people and he would examine them and he would try to, he would bring things with him and care for them. And there were, I remember reading articles about this when I was a young lawyer, about uh, this crazy person who was going <laughs> under the bridge to deliver care. Um, so his innovations have been extraordinary, and they have been lifelong. After he stopped, uh, or I guess you may still occasionally go under a bridge, I don't know, but um, homeless people in Miami were her, um, um, marshaled under bridges for a very long time. Um, after he stopped doing that, uh, he's a gastroenterologist in private practice, has the kind of practice that you would expect, and I'm gonna talk at the end about his credentials, but I really wanted to make this personal. Um, so he founded uh, free clinics in South Florida, so one of the first free clinics for homeless people at the Camillus House um, and in Homestead. Uh, Joe has had a commitment, and his commitment, and I know this now from having met him and worked with him, and he is my colleague, my friend. I almost forgot, he's also my boss, for at least for my <laughs> faculty appointment. So for those of you I told, he's told you he's not my boss, he actually is my boss, <laughs> and um, uh, I'm expecting to pay for that later. <laughs> But Joe uh, continued um, forging ahead, even as he had his private practice, and conducted himself in the way, in a patient-centered way, that he would like to be treated as a person. He has always treated everybody he encounters, every patient. And um, when we first got together at FIU, I think I probably told Joe, I know of you. And he said, I know about Baptist. Well, we won't get into that. <laughs> um, but in any event, uh, he told me he wanted to do something insane. He didn't say, I want to do something insane. What he said to me is, we're going to design a curriculum for medical students where we have household-centered care that he'll talk about much more eloquently than I can, where we have household-centered care, 
where we're going to have multidisciplinary teams of students and faculty, and they're going to go out into these people's homes. They're going to take histories and physicals. They're going to do, um, have an outreach worker that comes through and, and, uh, and, and has them complete a questionnaire about social determinants. We're going to build community partnerships, and we're going to do all of this basically with no gravity, no rules, and don't worry about it, everything will be fine. <laughs> And I can remember, he must have been about three syllables into this discussion, when I thought to myself, and I think he knew from the look on my face, and you, those of you know me, I don't, I'm not a poker player, that I thought he had lost his mind. <laughs> and the reason I did is I'm one of the lawyers in the group, and my responsibility is <coughs> to assist the faculty with creating safe environments for the students <laughs> and for patients. <laughs> and I could not think of a more unstructured, dangerous environment than somebody's home, particularly, and, and I, I won't go into this too much, but somebody's home in a very high crime rate, uh, area that has a very high crime rate. So I immediately thought of armed guards and, you know, what's going to happen and patient safety and how are we going to record the medical care, et cetera. And as I'm thinking this, Joe has already virtually implemented the program. <laughs> um, he knows that I'm not always uh, an ask for forgiveness person, but in this particular case, it worked out great. And he has been truly uh, an innovator. And it's, it is hard in healthcare. One of the things when I first came in that I noted and I talked to the other lawyers about was, hey, uh, you all are proposing a lot of crazy things, and there are a lot of laws that prohibit this. We happen to have been in a space, I just lost this, happen to be in a space where this would work. So now I'm going to talk about Joe's accolades, his credentials, because they truly are extraordinary. Um, he's Associate Dean for Community Engagement and the Department uh, Chair for, it is the Department of Humanities, this is my fault, Health and Society. Interim Chair in the Department of Medicine at Florida International University. And as I said, oh yeah, he's my boss. <laughs> so um, FIU, um, Joe was talking about, is the fifth largest university in the country. It has 55,000 students. Most of them are not medical students. We have, uh, as of this next year, we'll have 480 medical students. And it is um, the, probably the most diverse university in the country. And certainly our medical school is one of the most diverse medical schools in the country. Um, and Joe has um, led faculty, students, and truly led them. I think of Pino whenever I think of Joe. <laughs> Uh, he is visionary, and he is a coach, he's been a mentor, and um, he has given people the ability to fail fast and correct, um, and, uh, and been truly an innovator in every way. Um, he's a, a, on the board of uh, RAND, and also he chairs the board of its graduate school. Now, he went to medical school at, I'm going to get this wrong, so the, for the Spanish speakers, um, I just want forgiveness right now. <laughs> um, La Universidad Católica Madres y Mestra. How did I do, Joe? Pretty close. Okay. <laughs> In the Dominican Republic, um, he trained and is board certified, uh, trained at the University of Miami at Jackson Memorial Hospital. He is board certified in gastroenterology and did a fellowship in hepatology. So this is the part of Joe that you would never guess that if you spoke to him for a long time, you might never know. He recently, in 2009, received the President's Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian honor that a person in the United States Thanks. can get. My mother said he received the Jefferson Award for public, for public Service Benefiting the Disadvantaged. He was a recipient in the early 90s of the MacArthur Genius Grant Award. And recently, and the thing that I know he's least proud of, he is a great Floridian. He got the Great Floridian <laughs> Award. <laughs> That's right. Named after a hotel in Orlando. <laughs> so Joe worked um, for uh, the the Bush administration. Uh, the one senior, senior. I was going to say the one that got it a little bit more right, and you can be the judge of that. Um, and he worked for the Clinton administration, helping with health care reform. Um, with our dean, Joe has forged a curriculum that's now been implemented um, through all of the impossibilities that I thought were there. Uh, I will tell one other story. At one point, the students want to start a free clinic, and there are limits. And there was no plumbing in the building. 
And I said, well, what are they going to do about washing things, et cetera? And he said, well, we'll get a bucket. And I said, Joe, that's just where we start. <laughs> there are going to be no buckets. Um, and I think the thing that uh, is most impressive about Joe, in addition to he could have done stand-up, he's disruptive. Um, insistent and he has changed the face of our community and with that I am honored to present Joe Greer. Thank you. Peter, I, I, I hope I do well by Bonnie tonight. Well, let me just start off with a question that I'm going to ask at the end. When did it become socially acceptable in the United States of America to refuse a patient because they had no money? I want you to think about that. I want you to think about the fact, not just that we do that, but it's socially acceptable. That carries a very heavy weight in how we measure our society. Jody, thank you for those words. My mother wrote them. Tonight I hope to talk to you about not how things are done, but what I believe to be the most important reason is why we do things. The why and the how have to go together. The why always has to trump the how. The how can be replaced. The why has to be static. I hope to talk to you about the importance of a mission, a vision, and a cause. Not unlike what you're doing here at Dartmouth bringing people together for effective change in this country to improve the lives of the least fortunate. Sure, it's about efficiency and quality and the measurements we've done for the last 50 years in health science research, but those are just tools to get to where we're going. I, I'm driven by something I was brought up with, social justice our responsibility to improve the lives of the most vulnerable in our, our communities, our state, our country, and the world. That is our responsibility. Everybody sitting in this room has a position of power. And you carry a responsibility for not only those that you employ, but those that you have dedicated your life to serve. So it becomes really, really important to understand that. But before I get started, let me tell you a little something about myself. My name is Pedro Jose Greer, Jr. I think my father still is laughing about doing that. <laughs> I grew up at a very interesting time. I'm Cubish. I'm Cuban-Irish. That means I come from one poor, small, corrupt Catholic island to another poor, small, corrupt Catholic island. <laughs> I've been married 34 years. My wife is Irish Catholic. I have earned the right to define the Irish Catholic. <laughs> People whose impending sense of tragedy is what holds them together during brief moments of joy. <laughs> Being half Cuban and half Irish, the Cuban half, I know that life is a conspiracy. <laughs> Being half Irish, I know I'm going to fail. <laughs> Being Cubish, I relish in the thought that it's Fidel Castro's fault. So. I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. I was born in Miami by accident. My mother was visiting, went back to Cuba, so I'm in essence a natural born immigrant. I grew up in a time of change, in a time of hope, in a time my parents didn't understand. Long hair, hippies, smoking pot, football, football? Wake up pelota, play baseball, which I personally find one of the most boring games in the world, and I recommend it to many of my post cardiac patience. <laughs> However, it is one of the best exports we have from Cuba, that and cigars. I grew up at a time in a southern town, a racist southern town, a southern town that not until the mid to late 70s were African Americans allowed on Miami Beach without a special ID. Where they used to call us, the Cubans, Oyes, because we'd always scream Oye. I remember the first time I was saying last night somebody called me a spick. I had no idea what the hell that was. I came home thinking, wow, they think we're clean. <laughs> <laughs> spick and span, this is so good. <laughs> My mother said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I played football at the University of Florida. Well, I didn't play. I decided 
to take the scholarship. There's a big difference. And I got up there the second year they had desegregated the Southeastern Conference. Imagine that. Southeastern Conference, just white guys playing. We didn't do that well back then. <laughs> and when I got up there, the dorms were segregated. My last name was Greer. He had to be black. All Greer's are black. And he's got a name like Pedro. What white people would name a child Pedro? So I got there, and I got to my dorm. And it was interesting, because I told this story at the commencement of the University of Florida Medical School that didn't accept me, that I said my two most important lessons when I had just turned 18. I got to my dorm, my roommate, Charlie Horse Johnson, who ended up playing for Cincinnati in the early 70s, looked down at me. He was the largest human being ever from the state of Georgia, and just said, shit. I thought you'd be black. Now, I weighed my options in that dorm hallway. There I was, looking up to somebody huge. I figured five of my steps were one of his. And I looked at him and said, it's worse than you think. <laughs> I said, I'm Cuban. I said, we look like them, but for God's sakes, we dance like you. And my two most important lessons, if they're really big, become their friend. And if we go through life looking for what we have in common, and not what differentiates us, then we can accomplish anything we want. And the other rule that goes along with that is, if we're willing not to take the credit for it, there isn't anything we can't accomplish. So because of our position and our financial backing and who we are, don't forget the reason you're doing it and don't let your ego get in the way. Because our mission goes far beyond those that decide to go into selling widgets. I've never known what widgets were, but that's what they talk about all the time. We're here about people's lives. And that carries a very heavy responsibility. When I was in medical school, my mother called me. My little sister was going to come. We were going to meet for her 18th birthday. I mean, she was killed in a car accident. Now, I'm the only male of an immigrant family, Hispanic immigrant family, and the boy is supposed to be responsible for everybody. You can imagine what I went through. My disbelief in God, all, everything you can imagine. At her funeral, which I had to put together and all that because my parents were devastated, and I remember going there in the limousine to bury her. For the first time in my life, I felt old. I was 22 year, 23 years old. I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. I had never felt that before. And when I got there, there were two busloads of elderly people. I didn't know this, but she used to volunteer with them in high school. Years later, at the clinic we started for the homeless, I learned that in the shelter, she had led a group there to feed the homeless. And I realized that in less than 18 years, a week less than 18 years, she lived more than most of us get to live in a lifetime. And the only deal God gives us is if we get to be born, we get to die. And it's what we do in between that span that makes a difference in our lives, the lives of people around us, as well as in our performance and our jobs and everything else we do. And so I made a promise to God that if I ever got to be a doctor, I never wanted to see anybody die or suffer alone. Now there's a problem when you make a promise to God. Where are you going to hide? Well, in Miami we have City Hall. And based upon the policies that they set, we know God has never visited City Hall. So you could hide there. But what ended up happening was, on one, my first intensive care rotation as an intern at Jackson Memorial Hospital, at the time the busiest public hospital in the United States, I had an individual who was dying of pulmonary tuberculosis intubated in the ICU. This is before HMO, so we could do anything we wanted. And uh, there we were, 24-7, looking at his numbers. On his wrist was a band that had his name, his date of birth, which appeared to belong to a much younger individual. And it said, no address. No address meant that fire rescue had found him under a bridge or in the streets. Based on that, Miami, not known as the most compassionate community in this country, but the bling is fantastic, let me tell you, South Beach is fun. There were two shelters at the time in Miami, and I went to visit them both. 
And what I saw were things I had never imagined that homeless were. To me, back in the early 80s, and if you remember correctly, there was a huge recession. Reagan was president. Crack hit the streets. HIV hit the streets. Miami's a cocaine hub at the time. Miami was devastated. Cocaine money kept us alive for buying buildings, but it destroyed the inner city. So I decided to go under the bridges to see what was going on. And that was my first introduction to the social determinants of health. I realized that as a physician, when we started our clinic and treating patients, all I did was take care of consequences. I mean, I think, why do we call medical school preparing students for health care? We don't teach them any health. We teach them disease and disease intervention. I asked students the other day, I did six colonoscopies this morning. How many people's quality of life did I improve? None, yeah. So actually, I sort of hurt six people. The six people I did the colonoscopy on, the six people that had to drive them home, they all had to miss a day of work. Well, what have you pulled out of polyp? I improved their quality of life seven to ten years down the line, but definitely not today. So I think we have to reassess on what we say we're doing. We don't have health care delivery systems. We have disease intervention systems. That's what we do. But yet we expect our country to become healthier. We're talking about population health. We're talking about value-based care. And where's the biggest issue right now that I think needs to be changed more than even the industry? Medical education. We need to change medical education. We need to change our admissions process. Seriously? You have to take more chemistry to get into medical school than you do to apply for a graduate degree in chemistry? All doctors here, can somebody please give me the Krebs cycle? <laughs> oh, you don't have it. Can anybody spell it? It's a K. <laughs> so unless you're going into bench research, or pharmacology, do we really need these hardcore sciences? Because Fleckner told us we didn't have enough science. Remember Fleckner? He did that report that was sanctioned by the Carnegie Mellon Foundation in 1909, published in 1910 through Hopkins, that showed that medical education was lacking in science and too interested in money. Well, we got the science part down. <laughs> got to work on that money part a little bit, okay? Now, I can't return the money I've made because I have children. <laughs> and they've taken my money. My, my daughter, who I'm very proud of, ended up going to uh, Harvard Law School, and, but she does public interest law. And as I was saying here, when she first took her first job at, with the Advancement Project in Washington, I said, you know, Alana, Mom and I are going to buy you a car for graduation. She said, Dad, I live in Washington. I don't need a car. I said, no, honey, to live in. <laughs> because... I, I've seen the amount of money you make, <laughs> and this would really be helpful to you. <laughs> and my son, who studied theology and uh, philosophy, is a great bartender. <laughs> He's actually an improvisational comic and actor. And uh, he tells me that comedy is the last bastion of social incorrectness to tell the true social story. And so I'm proud of him. At least he doesn't cost as much as my daughter. <laughs> I had the advantage of being invited. I'm, I'm like the Forrest Gump of medicine. Stuff happens and I don't deserve it. But I'll take advantage of it and see what I can learn. Because the other thing that's vitally important is just not the mission and the how and the why, but the exercise of observation. We design systems without going into neighborhoods and seeing what people really need. What do we academicians traditionally do? Go into a neighborhood, do a survey, then we leave. Sometimes we'll give them the results. As a social scientist that I first hired to help put our program together and pretty much designed it, Dr. Luther Brewster looked at me and said, you know, Joe, the problem with you doctors is you go into a neighborhood and you ask people what they need. You ask them, and how many people have you gone to a household and said, what do you need? And they said, a colonoscopy. I need a mammogram. No, I have foreclosure issues. I have behavioral health issues at home. There's safety issues. I need a job. There's too many drugs or gangs in the street. Because the neighborhoods we're in is not the neighborhood I live in in Coral Gables, which I refer to as the city for the financially gifted. <laughs> we go into the north part of town, where you have the highest crime probably in the southeast. And we've never had an incident, and I'll tell you why. When we started our homeless clinic, 
back in the late 80s during the NBA basketball championship that was held in Miami, there were riots. Our clinic was right in the middle of the riots. They protected our clinic. Our clinic didn't get touched. All the other buildings got torched. Why? Because the clinic belonged to them, not to us. And that's the way we did it. I remember back in the early mid 80s with the rise in HIV, and I'm in a Catholic clinic, and I'm brought up Catholic, and I'm a Knight of Malta and St. Gregory the Great, and I'm handing out condoms. So one of our uber Catholic doctors reported me to the Archbishop. I've been sent to the principal's office a lot my whole life. <laughs> I, I had the record for detention in my Marist High School. And when I got there, I tried to handle things with humor, and Archbishop McCarthy, who we've been becoming very good friends with, looked at me and said, Dr. Greer, I hear you're handing out condoms in a Catholic clinic. And I said, Your Excellency, we, we put holes in them, we bless them. <laughs> I, 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 I want you to know that did not break the ice, okay? <laughs> so, we ended up having a discussion on the sanctity of human life. He talked to an aide, a few minutes later the aide came back and the Archbishop looked at me and said, I hear the sidewalks belong to the city. After that he put together all the religious leaders and got the governor to start a tax so that we could have a homeless fund. And uh, it's sometimes asking for forgiveness a little bit because you truly believe it's right. It's what your mission and your vision is. And the vision is not better health care for the homeless. The vision is not for me to prevent colon cancer. The vision is not for me to reduce the incidence of the disease. The mission is to improve the quality of life of individuals. And improving the quality of life of individuals, medicine plays a small part. However, we seem to control all the money and all the power. So are we brave enough to question ourselves and say, are we truly here to improve people's life? Or are we going for those quality indicators? In my neighborhood, you don't need a whole outreach team. We do pretty well. But when we started putting this together and we went into the community, we did two things. One, which we did it subliminally, but I'm going to tell you about it right now. By going and making relationships with our community partners, right now 180 community partners, in the poorest neighborhoods of Dade County, where in some of our neighborhoods the average income of a family of four is less than $25,000 a year. And do you really think that diabetic you discharged with that piece of paper that gave him a diabetic diet can either A, understand it, because they probably didn't get a good public education, definitely not in Florida. Okay, so their comprehension skills are down, and do you really think they can afford it? The hypertensive patient that lives in South Florida where we have no public transportation, and it's August, and he's got to take three buses to get to the clinic and pay the copay. you don't think his blood pressure went up at 90 degrees temperature and 95% humidity? So what do we do? We give him more antihypertense. Does a 24-year-old, perfectly healthy young woman that's pregnant really need to see the OBGYN nine times? Do they? Can't we send somebody out to the household to take a blood pressure? And when we go with our teams, our teams consist of medical students, law students, school of education students. We're now getting the school of business involved, nursing students and social work students. Public health we tried to get, but they hate leaving their office. <laughs> and so, Sorry, <laughs> I had to throw that out. <laughs> but they'll give us a survey. And, <laughs> and so, when we're there and their main issue is foreclosure, or employment, or behavioral issues, we have those that can help them. Because as we explain it to the students, every single day, that individual, which is so vulnerable, has one job, they got to climb to the top of a mountain, and on the backpack that they're carrying, they have 5,000 pounds. That's their daily toll. And of those 5,000 pounds, 1,000 might be medical. But they're worried about getting their kids fed, not being foreclosed on. As wealth divides even greater in this nation, it even gets worse for the vulnerable population in our country.
So unless we could deal with those things, how do we get to it? In Miami Gardens, we superimposed national cancer data and found out that they had the highest rates of metastatic breast cancer in the state of Florida and third highest in the country. We bought a 3D mammogram van, the students raised money, and we went to the community and started talking with them there. This is what they told us. Oh, we can get mammograms at public health, but it's transportation, or I have no daycare, or I can't afford myself and three kids to get there and lose a day of work. Oh, and by the way, who's going to follow me up? What if it's positive? What if I get called back? The one woman who had a copay in this very poor community told us about a post mastectomy complications. Went home with a pick line, couldn't afford the antibiotics. The church started pitching in to pay for her antibiotics. She felt so bad about it because in the neighborhood she lives in and they were using the money for her antibiotics, she asked the church to stop. And she ended up dying. So the women there told us, why should we get a mammogram? We're going to die anyways. In the United States of America, in communities that go far beyond our community, in communities that have this diversity and disparities of incomes. Yes, social determinants are the most important aspect in healthcare. Dr. Bob Brooks from Moran Corporation tells us, and he's one of the most published authors in health quality and health science, that there's three really basic types of delivery systems in healthcare. The classic one that we have now, doctors, nurses, hospitals, nursing homes. There's the public health model, food safety, preventing outbreaks of disease and pandemics, responding to diseases within communities. None of these two offer health. All of them try and prevent just disease. But the most important factor in the world and in this country for disease is socioeconomic. Why is it not on the table? Why is that not the main discussion? And the social determinants of health model, which makes you look into everything from education, policies, laws, transportation, is what will improve people's health. We published a study in the Southern Medical uh, Journal, not a great study, but it was our first two cohorts of students. And we were able to reduce ER usage in the population we were taking care of from 66 to 26 percent without medical intervention. These were first and second year medical students. Seriously, they're like medical idiots. I mean, they, they, they aren't going to do like any major medical thing in there. But by educating, getting them hooked up with what they needed, and letting them know what they needed to do, that was an incredible drop. And the reason that was a significant drop was the only significance in the study was not that drop, because the control team that we used was the outreach team that we hired from the community had the same drop. So there was no, you know, by chi-square analysis, there was no significant difference. However, in getting blood pressure checks, getting screened and all that, they improved. From a company's perspective, they got to love that. Now, when we hired the outreach team, it was an issue because a lot of them didn't even have a high school education, or some, most of them did. Now, if you apply to work at a university, they ask the first question, what's your last degree? So we had to change those policies to be able to hire them. When they went into the communities, they would go volunteer in the community-based organizations, whether it was a faith-based NGO, mom-pop shop, elementary school, middle school, city council, police. Why? So that they knew that we were not there just to take from them, but to learn from them and work with them. So now we had the community-based organizations are the ones that refer the sickest families to us. At the beginning, we did only uninsured. Now that some are able to get Medicaid, we'll take Medicaid. And why did we do that? Because if we open a clinic, a motivated person will show up. Maybe a little late, but they'll show up. But when Mrs. Garcia, the second grade teacher, calls us up and says, Juan hasn't been here in six days, I think they'd be a great candidate for your program, and we go find out Juan's not there, because Juan's grandmother is demented. And for those of you that have a demented individual or a person with a chronic illness in your family, you know it isn't cheap to take care of them. A study has already shown that the care for the dement dementia in this country exceeds the care for cancer and cardiovascular disease put together. So you can imagine that burden there. So his grandmother is being taken care of by him. He falls back in school, can't graduate, doesn't have the ability to get to college. But we're going to concentrate on the dementia. When I was in medical school, I remember one of these alarming statistics back in the late 70s that in pediatric oncology that families 
of children with malignancies had the highest rates of divorce or separation in this country. And I said, great. We save a kid and we destroy a family. What are we doing wrong? Where are we not offering the support that we need? Have we so concentrated on the basic sciences and diseases as I was in my training to go through medicine, GI, hepatology, that we forgot that all we're doing is taking care of consequences? If 80% of these diseases can actually be prevented by dealing with the social determinants of health, and we're the leaders in supposedly to promote health, why aren't we waving that flag? We begin our students in the first nine weeks with the ethical foundations of medicine and we integrate that into every course. Why? Well, because I'm from Miami. And nobody can spell ethics. As a matter of fact, I will tell you where the government used the word ethics. When we had the big python kill, that like you could kill the pythons in the Everglades, but you had to do it ethically. It actually said that. I don't know how you kill a python ethically. <laughs> But that's the only time they use that term. But then I said, let's question ourselves in our own ethics, not just poor policies or the ethics that occur on a patient-physician relationship. I'm a gastroenterologist. About 10 years ago, we published our first paper after looking at all these colonoscopies and the rates of colorectal cancer that African Americans had a 40% higher incidence of colorectal cancer and a 25% higher mortality rate. So we recommended that African Americans be screened at the age of 45, not 50. Great, but we told nobody. We presented it at the American College of Gastroenterology meeting. We published it in our journals. You would think we might want to tell some primary care doctors. And if the rate of death is that high, we want, might want to notify the New York Times. Because if it's a virus, it'll make the front page. But we felt that we did our duty. We published our paper. Well, publishing isn't, isn't, isn't important anymore. The publishing has to lead to impact. It has to lead to change. You know, we got to change that in our academic circles. It's no longer to come in and bring the medical student because we want you to be, you know, the ophthalmologist or the hepatologist. We got to change the whole game. We did that at our medical school. Our core faculty, which in my division, department, which is the Department of Humanities, Health, and Society, and I left medicine, the word out, completely. We have the division of family medicine. In that division, I have internists, psychiatrists, pediatricians, med peds. In that division, they're our core faculty. I pay them from our core funding from the state. They are not required to make money clinically. They are required to teach. Their clinical responsibilities come in when we send our medical vans to neighborhoods where they're not there and they do the clerkships there. Or the clerkships that we have at the Department of Health and the joint venture we're doing with them taking care of the poorest neighborhoods. You'll get your clinical experience, but I don't want you motivated by if I do more clinical, I'll make more money, and then the student's left behind. Our dean came in and said we have one focus, education. Not clinical, not research, education. Why? Because we have to produce physicians for this new millennium. And by the way, Joe, see if your team can prove that educational dollars can improve the health care uh, outcomes of an, uh, a community. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll get a lot of support on that one. So we put this team together with Jody, with Lou, with David Brown, with Sonia Benitez, and these brilliant minds put together this program that is preparing these students for the future. In that really bad article we had, we had this wonderful commentary by two Hopkins physicians. I'm so glad they didn't comment on the study. But what they did say was the program, and this has made us very proud and I will brag, that in the article by Rock et al., John Rock is our, our dean, we were one of the few schools that was actually preparing our students for the future of healthcare in this country. Emphasizing interdisciplinary teamwork from day one, population health, and since our students are assigned households from the day they get to medical school, they learn about longitudinal care. It's not 12 weeks of medicine. It's four years of taking care of OBGYN, surgery, pediatrics, psychiatry. That's what medicine is. I says, unless you're a really bad doctors, your patients tend to come back after 12 weeks. So yeah, that's what we got to get to do. We got to change medical education. We have to change admission practices. We have to change the industry. And the reason we have to do that is because people's lives depend on it. We are the ones that carry 
that burden because we elected to, not because somebody told us we had to. Unless your mother forced you to go to med school, that's, an, <laughs> that's another story. And I challenge us in that way, and I say these things, because without this, where are we going to go? Then we started looking at patient-centered care. Well, that works sometimes with diabetes. But why doesn't it work? Because we're still making the patient come to us. So why don't we do and measure household-centered care? And we're working with Rand now in methodologies to be able to, me to measure that unit. Why is that important? One illness in a family will affect the dynamics of that entire family, whether it is income, behavioral health, everything else. And if we're there to improve people's quality of life, it includes all of that. Do you really think, as I tell the students, if I give you the cleanest bill of health, your stress test, your chest x-ray, your labs, everything is perfect, and you get home and your house is in foreclosure, you find out your spouse ran away and your kid's in prison, how healthy do you feel? That's what life's about. And if we have such control and such power, let's really test ourselves. Let's turn around and say, let's make a difference. Let's make America the healthiest country in the world. You guys, I'm pretty competitive. 34th? <laughs> Seriously, I remember when the Miami Heat, which were, their stadium was a block away from our homeless clinic, the city of Miami wanted to arrest the heat on the night of, the homeless on the night of heat games. This was their first year when Billy Cunningham was one of the owners. We used to call it Brooklyn South. And the team was 1 in 15. And they asked me to speak in front of the city commission. And I got up there, I said, you know, I'm a competitive fellow. You want to arrest the homeless on the night of heat games, they're 1 in 15. For God's sakes, arrest the coach. <laughs> and leave the homeless alone. Well, I don't like ranking in the 30th and being twice as expensive as anybody else. I want us to be the healthiest nation because for those of you that like to make a great living like I do, in reality, in a nation, health means wealth. Healthy people are productive. Healthy people can produce. Healthy people progress. A strong middle class, it's so important. And we have the power to make that difference. Our elected officials aren't going to do it. Come on, you guys, seriously? Have you seen Congress lately? I have. Have you seen our representatives? I'm Cuban-American. They asked, like I said, they asked Ted Cruz the other day what he thought of Roe versus Wade. He said, I don't care how the Cubans get to Miami. <laughs> so, yeah, I can make fun of them. I'll do it in Spanish, too, if you want. And don't worry, the Democrats can be just as bad, but I'm one of four Cuban Democrats. We meet on a phone booth on 8th Street. <laughs> I remember working under Lou Sullivan at HHS when one time down there at the Hubert Humphrey building, he told us we needed more minority or underserved minorities in medical school, which I agreed with, he said, to take care of underserved minorities. And I raised my hand and said, I call me. My name is Pedro. Do I like it, the barrio? Does John Smith III, does he get Wall Street? All doctors have an inherent responsibility to take care of people without prejudice. And that's how we have to do it. And I remember in the Clinton, during the transition and then the health reform, I remember when we went to go meet Clinton in the Oval Office, and I was there, you could tell, uh, I was a dean at the University of Miami at the time, an associate dean, and they had faculty there from Hopkins and from Harvard. You could tell the Hopkins faculty because they would congratulate each other. <laughs> the, uh, the Harvard faculty introduced themselves as God, not the God, but one of the many gods from the Boston area. <laughs> and I introduced myself as Pedro Greer, one of four Cuban Democrats we meet in a phone booth on A Street. Nobody laughed. <laughs> so I held up my badge and I said, we don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> we got into Watergate without these things. <laughs> and and I, and I say these things and I say them with humor because when I do the humor, at least maybe it'll stick with them. But I think we're the ones that have to maintain the mission, that have to maintain the cause, that have to remember those that we're taking care of. I wrote a book a few years ago that seven people bought. <laughs> All of them in my family. And one of the great things about being a physician is the experiences we have when we come across patients and what we can learn from them. And I'm going to end up with two stories. And excuse me for reading. It was a Tuesday night at the clinic when a young woman in a tattered red dress came in. She was about 25 years old, but seemed a lot older. The lines of her battle-weary face barely concealed beneath a smudge of stale makeups. Her soiled clothes, a swath of spandex, told the story of her hard life on the streets. Her eyes revealed her turmoil. 
whatever her story. At the very least, she deserved a bath and a rest. That night, I was working with third and fourth year medical students, and I sent Carlos, a third year student, in exam room two, where she sat weeping. Within minutes, Carlos came rushing out of the exam room. Dr. Greer, he called in a hurried tone. I can't get a history out of her. I don't know what to do. I said, what's the problem? He says, I don't know. She's crying like a baby. I can't get her to talk to me. I said, what's your guess? Physical, emotional, drugs? I insisted giving him a, hand, a signal to follow me. I don't know, he repeated more urgently as we walked toward the exam room. He opened the chart and he said, she's been here once before, some derm conditions. Oh, he says, there's no history of psych problems. But she does smoke crack, he says. It must be the perks of prostitution, he tells me. We stepped into the exam room where we found a desperate woman. She was trembling. I extended my hand to greet her. We're here to help you. Do you, re do you hurt somewhere? I asked, gently nudging her elbow to give her a sense of stability. She was full of tears, gasping for air. We do something very, very special in this country as physicians. We physically touch other human beings. Maybe we should do more clinical and physically touch them more, but that's something you have to do with the utmost respect for a patient, every single patient. For those of us that are in academics, I hope you don't let more than one student ascultate a lung at a time. That's a human being that's sitting there. It hurts down here, she said, between sobs, holding her lower abdomen and doubling over. It feels like it's burning, it won't stop. Please, help me, please. The nurse and I let her calm down a bit before we laid her on the stretcher. And I examined her. I palpated her tender belly and examined her completely. I concluded that her signs in the exam suggested a mix of public inflammatory disease and other sexually transmitted diseases. It'll be okay, I told her trying to offer a little reassurance. Slowly, she began to tell us why she had really come to the clinic, when she could have gone to the gynecologist at the public health unit, which was one of the best in the country. Looking down, she said, I was raped, raped hard last night, as she doubled over again in tears and in shame. Why didn't you go to the rape treatment center, I said. It's one of the best in the country. Doctor, she said with a look that suggested I should know the answer to my own question. Look at me. Look at how I'm dressed. She then paused and broke into sobs. I couldn't take the comments people would make. The comments people would make prevent a human being in our country from seeking health after being violated. What kind of people would do that? Who are we to judge others? We're physicians, we can judge an illness. We might not like somebody, but who are we to do that when a patient walks in? But you know what? I learned a lot from her, not from my professor. You see, she was right. We have this mammoth system of health care that could offer excellent medical care and all the best technology. But systems and buildings, they offer no solace, no empathy, no protection from prejudice. That's because when we build buildings, there's a gaping hole in the construction. You see, you can't construct a heart. You can't construct the soul. That's each and every one of us that works in whatever industry or business we are in. We are the heart and we are the soul. And because of that, our job becomes more important because it's not just about us in the business, it's about those that work with us to show the example so that a woman that has been violated is not afraid to walk in through the front door to be taken care of. That's where I learned my lessons. And I'm gonna end up with this last story that goes, one afternoon around lunchtime, I walked into the clinic with a sandwich. I greeted the patients in the waiting room, walked over to the pediatric area where I found a mother with three of her children. They told me they had come in from the Salvation Army shelter. Her youngest child caught my eye. He was six years old, a little boy with a sweet smile. I had a bag lunch. I'm Catholic. I feel guilty already. I didn't need the lunch. I'm a non-purging bulimic. You'll get... Thank you. Some of you got it. Okay. I offered him my bag lunch, which he graciously accepted. He took the sandwich out of the bag and he split it in half. He took two bites out of one half and slipped both parts into the bag. Then he carefully bolted the bag and put it in his pocket. Why'd you do that? I asked him. His reply stunned me. 
You know what it must be like to be a homeless child? You know what it must be like when you're in school and they say, draw me your house, and what do you draw, a shelter or a car? You know what it must be like when you have dinner and every night's a shelter dinner because that's what we can afford in these charities? You know what it must be like? I have two kids. They're older now. But I remember my daughter, three years older than my son, if she was nine years old and he was six and he found a toy of hers that she hadn't used in six years, the first thing she would say is, that's mine. And they have their stuff. It might be a rock, but it's their stuff. And if you think the kids are frustrated, how do you think mom feels? And statistically, it's going to be a single mom in there. She's either been abused or her, or her spouse or partner is in prison, at least those are statistics down south. And when you get to be a homeless child, guess what? You get to come to a homeless clinic. Isn't that great? Because everybody now knows you're homeless in a country that doesn't care about economics. And guess what? We give you whatever somebody doesn't like. Because people don't donate what they like. They donate what they don't like. And one Christmas we asked the homeless kids, what would you like for Christmas? You know what they told us? Socks and underwear. Nobody donates socks and underwear. I think it was Socrates who taught us to question assumptions. Observation. Who makes you think, who makes me think that I have the answers? I don't. I live in a very protected bubble. If I want to really find solutions, I got to roll up my sleeve and ask people that actually know. I said, why'd you do that? And the little boy looked up at me and said, it's for my brothers. He was hungry, but he knew his brothers were just as hungry. God has allowed me to study medicine to explore the depths of disease and its treatment. He's given me brilliant professors and inspiring mentors, opened the tombs of healing and placed in my hands the most precise instruments of modern technology. And on any random afternoon, God can appear with the most remarkable postgraduate opportunities. Allow him to find in the gentle lull of the city of Miami under a bridge in an emergency room, in the waiting room of a home of a neighborhood clinic, in the wisdom and humanity of a homeless child. The goodness of that child has stayed with me for years, and I've offered to ask myself, how can that lesson of his generosity be multiplied by a community, a government, an entire nation? And every morning I pray to God that I can be like that six-year-old child. And I end up with the same question I started with. When did it become socially acceptable to refuse a patient? Because they had no funding. Thank you.